Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Hey listen, um, today's the last, the last part of our series of Wildcard, and I want to talk to you about something um, that has to do with your future. Uh, every single one of you have a future. And, and I want you to understand that, that God knows that future. And there are things in life that get in the way of that beautiful future that God has for you. For example, I want you to know that if, you're, if your current condition is, is, is not the greatest right now, maybe your current condition is one of lack, maybe your current condition right now is one of health challenges, financial challenges, maybe relational challenges, but your current condition is not your permanent condition. And you have to understand that. It's not permanent. It's temporary. It, 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 this, it's like the scripture says, and this too shall pass. Whatever you're experiencing right now, whatever condition you're in right now, you should rejoice that God has a plan even for that place right now in life. And I want you to know also that God has something better than what you have right now in your current condition. Can you believe that today? Can you just accept that truth that God has something better? He does have something better beyond your current place that you're in right now. And so uh, what better verse to read than Jeremiah 29, 11? What I want to talk to you about today as we read this verse is, is how to fight for your future. Everybody say that with me. I got to fight for my future. I hope that your future is worth fighting for. I hope. Especially when, when, when you finally have the revelation that, that beyond your own ideas, your own planning, that God's plan is greater than your plan. Uh, that we have to come to that place. And so here in Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, I know. This is, this, is, this is God speaking to Jeremiah. Jeremiah obviously was constantly struggling. And let me tell you something. As, as a youth, when Jeremiah was called by God to be the prophet of, of the nation of Israel, he was challenged by people. He was challenged by his youth. People would look at him and be like, you're just some young, scrawny little kid. What, what are you, man, stop talking to us like you're it. And so he was challenged. I mean, just imagine you and I have been challenged in our, in our, in our, in our dreams and our visions and, and the future things that God has maybe shown you. Maybe, maybe you want to have kids and, and that's in your future and it's been challenged. Maybe you want to own a house and, and, and it's been years and that's been challenged. Maybe you've been wanting to be married and, and that's been a huge challenge, but it's in your future. And so Jeremiah, just so you understand the relation of, of why God spoke this message to Jeremiah was not only was he dealing with this condition, this issue, but the people of Israel were also dealing with some of the same issues that you and I deal with as well. Let me read this verse and you'll see what I mean. He says, I know the plans I have for you. This is God speaking to the people. I know the plans I have for you. Aren't you glad that someone knows that, he, that, you know, our plans praise Jesus, huh? He says, I know the plans I have for you announces the Lord. He says, I want you to enjoy success. I don't know about you, but I have found that most Christians don't enjoy success. Like they stand and they're believing, believing God gives it to them because they were faithful and, and, and they were committed. And then God gives it to them and then they're no longer enjoying it. it isn't, that, isn't that interesting? But, but think about it. I, I really believe that, that God is faithful to the success that, that one's committed to. But at the end of the day, you have to learn how to enjoy it when you're on God's plan. And so he says, and so I, I want you to enjoy success. I do not plan to harm you. So obviously, the people of God, including Jeremiah, kept thinking every time life happened that God was harming them. I'll use a different uh, a language right now and then he'd be like, oh yeah, it makes sense now. So God says to him, I have plans for you and they're not even plans to harm you. So obviously, if God's plan is not to harm you, then there must be an opposite, right, plan to harm you and we know that Satan, our enemy, wants to constantly harm you. So in this context, so you understand, the people kept looking at God as if his plans were to harm them. Do you get that? You'll see it right now. He says, I will give you hope 
for the years to come. And so in whatever condition you may be in, God has hope for that place right now. Right now, this very moment, whatever condition you're in, you may be in a funky condition. Man, you may be in an oppressive condition. You may be in depression condition. But guess what? God has hope for years to come because he gives you not only hope, but he gives you a future with that hope. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now, what do I mean by this? By, by I do not plan to harm you. Well, uh, many of us here have said this. I would, I would... I would have the courage to say everyone has. Where we have made comments like this, man, God's not faithful to his plan. Have you ever heard someone say, man, God just, you know, he's given me all these promises. God has shown me these plans that he would do with my life. But man, God's just not fulfilling his plan for my life. God is not doing what he said he would do. Has anyone ever said something like that? Or you've been mad at God? You've been upset at God, like, I can't believe God would even allow this. And, and, and I, think, I think many of us have been in this place where you hit a, a place in life where you just feel like God forgot you or like, or like God is bipolar and he doesn't remember his plans. I mean, that's why God says, I know, I know the plans I have for you. The question is, do you know my plans? Have you ever asked God, God, what is your plan for my life? I bet you that most Christians never ask that question. And be careful what you ask for because God will answer. He will. And so have you honestly ever said, God, what is your plan for my life? What's your plan? And you genuinely were positioning yourself to receive that plan, whatever it may be. And and I promise you, 99.9% of the time, it's not the plan you thought you would have with God. I, I promise you. And I know because that happened with me, and I, I thought my plans were to be chief of police. God said, no, you'll be a janitor in the ministry. That's how I started church. That's how it all started for me. It was a janitor. And, and I thought, I was doing better before church. God, what's up? But God says, I know the plans I have for you, Mauricio. Huh? Are there plans not to harm you? Right, their plans to prosper you, their plans to give you success, and you get to enjoy the success. Most people do not enjoy the success, and so um, today, in, 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 as we keep, you know, getting closer to heaven, all of us, you hear more and more people say, "God hasn't been faithful to me. God hasn't been faithful to His plans." God hasn't done what he said he would do. And then what happens is that people begin to quit and they lose hope. Or they lose hope and then they quit. But the truth is that not many stick around long enough to see God's plan be fulfilled. What do I mean by that? Well, listen, when I first got saved, I remember um, God showed me a picture. He showed me this, this, this vision and, and I saw the plans that God had for me. I couldn't understand it. I couldn't even interpret I'm like, God, why are you showing me all that stuff? I'm barely, I'm just, I'm just coming to you, Jesus. I'm just learning how to follow you right now. And God showed me his plans. He showed me his promises. And, and it was pretty awesome. But, but what happens is then life happens. And then years go by. 14 years later after God showed me his plans was the birthing of Elevate Church. But you have to stick around long enough to allow God to show you his faithfulness, his commitment to you. Uh, uh, And I can say that I was in a dysfunctional church for 14 years. But I thank God that I was willing to stay in my dysfunctional church that I had knowledge of than try to leave that church to go to another dysfunctional church that I know nothing of. So I'd rather enjoy my dysfunction than I know of, amen? Amen. So here's the good news. Elevate Church is not the perfect church. It is the dysfunctional church. Look at your neighbor and say, you're so dysfunctional. <laughs> just tell them, just, just be a, just man, you are dysfunctional. And if your spouse is next to you, give them a little extra sugar on top of that. You are so dysfunctional. Help me, Lord. Preach it right there, pastor. That was for, no, don't, don't even do that. Yo. <laughs> Why do I say that? Because the moment, the moment you begin to experience any form of dysfunction, you begin to say, well, that's not God for me. And that's the pattern that we see in the body of Christ. So I'm here to stir your little heart up today and say, you know what? I'm going to start hugging my dysfunction because at least I know my dysfunction in my church. Amen? 
I know how crazy my pastor is, praise Jesus. We'll just stay, we'll just stay with that dude because I'm not going to go get another pastor and he's crazy too and he's probably more crazy than this one right here. So just accept the fact that, man, we're all dysfunctional. Praise Jesus. But God is faithful in your dysfunction. He is faithful. When you're unfaithful, God remains faithful. When you're dysfunctional, God remains functional. That's our God. And parents, we have a big job because, you know what, we have to begin to, to really train and teach our children. We cannot lose this wonderful, beautiful gift that God has given us called faith. We have to continually just pour faith into our children. We got to continually teach our children of the Holy Spirit. We got to teach our kids, church, listen to me, we must teach our children the value of the local church. The only reason that I can personally say that though I have been hit with every possible trial you can think of when it comes to sicknesses and diseases, one of them being cancer God has been faithful because I've been consistent in the place that he calls me to and I have seen the blessings and the rewards of the father because of it amen it's taken years oh I wish he would have done it so much sooner like I saw perfect timing we're like God this is the moment go ahead and do it right here right now and God's like uh you know it's like crickets you don't hear nothing it's like God that was your opportunity man like these people can literally pay the bills and it's like, it just doesn't work that way. And so we need to begin to teach our children this, this sense of, of importance and value. And, and because here's the, reason, here's the reason, as a parent, it's not about you. It's about generations after you. It's about your children, and it's about your children's children. It's beyond you. So I have to at least have some foundation in my personal life and maturity to know that my family, my children have something that will sustain them and they'll be able to say, you know what, my mom or my dad or, or my grandma, my grandfather, man, they taught me how to be consistent. They taught me how to be faithful to God and we need faithfulness back in the house. If you're gonna fight for your future, you gotta remain faithful to God. Because he knows your plans. You have to be faithful to the one who knows your plans. So you might as well start learning how to be close to the one who knows your plans. Because the moment you get off of God's plan, it gets weird. And so today I want to talk about the perfect example. The children of Israel. You know, God... God delivers them from, from a poverty uh, uh, era. You know that he was, he was trying to get them from a place of, of slavery to the place of freedom and unfortunately 14 million uh, you know, Israelites later died in the, in the desert but that was by choice, it wasn't God's plan. Let me say that again, that wasn't God's plan, that was their choice. And so here's what happens. God brings them out through Moses and Moses begins to open up a church and, uh, and, and then he says, follow me. They all start following him and they're seeing miracle after miracle, breakthrough after breakthrough. I mean, Moses was walking in the power of God and the people were like, wow. It, when they were walking through the desert at night, it was freezing cold, but Moses would call on God and then God would bring a pillar of fire just to keep them warm at night. In the day, it was just like going to Palm Springs times 50. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? It's just demonic weather. You know what I'm saying? It's from the devil. Just like, ah, ah. I don't even know why people like going upon it. It's just, it's just. But anyways, uh, but then God says, let me give them shade. And he brings, he brings a cloud and, and he refreshes them. And then you know what? They had like, like their clothing. And, and God said, I care about even their clothing. And their clothing, he wouldn't allow any moth to eat up their cotton or their clothing. And their clothes were just in perfect condition. It was the perfect church with a perfect God, with the perfect leader to get them from, from the place of slavery to the place of blessing. And so Moses is, is preaching to them and giving them vision and he's helping them renew their mind because a lot of them have a, not only a poverty spirit, I mean, when you're in slavery for 400 years, it, it, your environment conditions you. Your environment literally begins to shape you and form you and mold you. For some of us, we come from poverty and for some of us are still in that same place of poverty mentality. God wants to set you free from not only a, a spirit of poverty, but God wants to set you free from a spirit of poverty poverty in the practical sense amen i mean we serve a big god guys and so 
And so we can relate to the children of Israel because they struggled with this poverty uh, spirit and this poverty mindset, but then God begins to preach to Moses or speak to Moses, and Moses begins to preach to the people, and he says, this is what God's showing me for us. And so they're like, what? God has some, I mean, if you really wanna be honest, if you wanted to bring it to practical terms, the children of Israel were homeless. They had no home. They are just strolling in the desert. They had no place to call home. And then God, God comes and he brings a message. He says, guess what? He says, I have a land for you. And he just begins to just kind of just speak to them and, and he starts pa- painting a picture. It's, it's a land with milk and honey. Oh, it's a land that's gonna be called home. It's the place where you and your children and your children's children, you will grow there, you will develop there, you will produce there. Man, you will see blessing after blessing. And he begins to paint a picture and it's like, yeah. And the people, like the people of Elevate Church are like, amen, glory to God, hallelujah. And everybody starts just, you know, doing the Christian these thing right we get all excited right Yay! we give God lip service but our actions are far from him okay we'll leave that for another sermon but anyways he yeah some of you got really sad right now but anyways so he gives you he was giving them a picture of a preferred future he's he was basically telling them what he already told Jeremiah the plans I have for you are not to harm you but to prosper you to give you success and enjoyment with that success and and of course we 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 all get excited when God shows you an image has God ever shown you a promise like maybe a house you've been believing for maybe uh, you know your future spouse or maybe you've seen your your future healing has anyone ever has God ever showed you any lift your hand just entertain me for a little bit will you (laughs) anything and if God hasn't shown you nothing that's because you have not asked what your plans are And so the people were like, amen, glory to God, hallelujah. And they loved the picture. And then, okay, so we know the story. Uh, Moses uh, hears from heaven, and he says, okay, I want them to go see the picture. And, And we know the story. They come back, and they start describing the picture. See, God will always give you. God will always, God will always. He may not give you details, but he will give you a picture. And then after God gives you a picture, you know what he does? He says, okay, kids, you guys ready? And you're just like, (laughs) what's that? (laughs) That's your preferred future. (laughs) No, but I want this one. (laughs) Yeah, well, that one one requires kneeling. Why do I got to kneel? Well, it requires prayer. Why do I got to pray? Because he has the plan. And he's got the details of that plan. Okay, what do I do now? I'm kneeling. Oh, you got to get to work. What do you mean I got to work? Yeah, you got to start looking for the pieces. Why do I need to look for the pieces? Because you want the picture, don't you? Well, yeah, I want the picture, but that's work. And so we start going through it, and we start off, because at first we're like, okay, great, and we start kind of putting our pieces together, but along the way, it's not fast enough. It's not quick enough. It's not, I can't see it, and we get all worried and freaked out, like maybe, maybe, and then we start forgetting, I'll, I'll take it a step further. Then we're like, you know what, forget that noise, and then we start changing God's plans. It's okay, you can leave that stuff, that's cool, it's anointed right there, it's boom, speaking to you. Oh, is that yours now? You keep it, girl. <laughs> you know what we do? You know what we do? Here's what we do. We start looking, we get exhausted, we're like, you know, maybe what God meant was this, and we bring out Legos. And now you're trying to take a Lego piece and you're trying to connect it to a puzzle piece and you're like, God, no, I know this would be so much better. And we're trying to, we're, we're living life year after year and we're just trying to do things our way because we're, we're too busy thinking, God, I'm sure what you really meant about your plan was this and then we alter God's preferred picture for the picture that we want to see. See, God was telling the children of Israel, I'm doing a new thing, Israel. You know what's scary when you read that verse, when we read and we all amen and like, yeah, amen, God's doing a new thing, praise God, hallelujah. We got all our spiritual, you know, our religious shout, right? I love it. So God says, I'm doing a new thing. The problem with that is God is doing a new thing, yet we keep doing the old thing, right? We keep doing the old thing because we're too busy doing our own thing. I'm doing a new thing, we do the old thing because we keep doing our own thing. 
Are you hearing me? God's doing a new thing, but you keep doing the old thing because you're willing to do your own thing. We have to come back to the promise and the plan of God and look at the picture that he showed you once before. Maybe for some of you, it got blurry. Well, guess what? Aren't you glad that God has the precious blood of Jesus that can wipe every blur away? He can wipe every sin away. Huh? He wants to show you again. But you and I have to kneel again. We need to ask the Father again. Father, remind me, what was it you showed me again? Because this is the, this is the moment right now where I need your help. As a matter of fact, in, in 1 Timothy 1.6, I think it's that one, he says, and this is how you will wage your warfare. This is how you will fight your battles well, by remembering the prophecies that were made concerning you. When you forget the pictures of God, you will always lose your battles. A- am I speaking to someone today? Okay, so, so God is showing them, and these guys, they, they start doing their thing. So God's saying, uh, I'm doing a new thing. So if God's doing a new thing, and you're still doing the old thing, then you're doing your own thing, period. And what happens with that? Impatience. Everybody say impatience. Look at my point up here. Impatience will always birth the thing that will fight the promise of God. Impatience will always. Everybody say always. always. Impatience will always birth the thing that will fight the promise, impatience. What do I mean by that? Well, let's think about Abraham and Sarah. Sarah was ticked off at her husband. He's like, man, dude, you're like, you know, a thousand years old and you didn't give me a child, you know, and she's bitter, resentful, angry. Let's just keep it real. She's angry. She's upset. Well, he's like, you know, probably thinking, dang, I couldn't perform. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't give a child. And, and so there's this constant battle between them and God. Sarah was getting really upset about God not fulfilling his plans. Like, yeah, yeah, Abraham, you come back and you're giving me all these words that God spoke to you. He'll be the father of nations. Dude, you don't even have a child. How are you going to be a father of nations? So now she's somewhat kind of mocking Abraham. And then Abraham's kind of like feeling the pressure. He's like, Oh, okay. He's like, God, you're funny, man. You just said I'll be the father of nations and, and, and the, the father of faith, but I have no child. And, and God gives them a promise. He gives them a plan. He says, you know what? Your wife, and she was old. I mean, old times 100, just old and just couldn't produce any more babies. She was old, just so you understand this. And so it, 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 required, it required her faith. It required her her receiving and accepting what naturally didn't make sense to her natural mind. And he said, God said that we're gonna have a child and and he's a promise and his name will be Isaac. And so you know the story, right? So what happens? Years go by. Many of us think that once God spoke the word, man, she was pregnant the next day. No, it was years, years. Nothing was happening. And so you know what? Abraham and Sarah get an idea like, well, Maybe what God meant, and that they bring out the Lego pieces. Maybe what God meant, huh? I know he said this, but maybe what he really meant was this. And so they go and they grab Hagar. And Hagar was the servant of Sarah. And, uh, and, he's, and, and they're like, well, why don't you just go ahead and just sleep with her and let's have a child. And maybe that, that's where the blessing's going to come from. And so we know what happened, right? He goes and conceives with Hagar they give birth to to a child by the name of what Ishmael here's the promise I mean the problem the problem is this is that Ishmael was never God's plan and and how many of us have been birthing Ishmael's because we're impatient and not realize that the very thing that you are so impatient about is going to drive you to go ahead and birth an Ishmael, not realizing that Ishmael later in the future ends up attacking your promised name, Isaac. Where, where did, where did uh, the religion of, 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 uh, of Muslim come out from? Who is it attacking? The people of God. Huh? And so in patience impatience we're trying to do this quicker we're trying to we want we, we need moving god come on get on with it you know let's go and so we start just creating these like we see these these opportunities that are good opportunities but we learn to we we we, we, we fail to interpret 
but is it a God opportunity? It's good. I mean, I can totally see how this can work out, but is it a God ordained? Is it a God plan or is it a me plan? Is it, is it from heaven or am I just making it up as I go, amen? And I think many of us can live there a lot of times and you're wondering why isn't it happening? So let, let's go to the verse real quick, Numbers 13, quickly. I gotta get out of here. Numbers 13, are you guys there? You guys get the picture now? Okay, so uh, now you have Ishmael. Boom, we got that. Let's go to Numbers 13, back to Mosey and the people. Verse one and two. So God is giving them a picture of a preferred future. He says, uh, the Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. There's another promise. I'm giving it to you, man. It's yours. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. So they sent out different family members. They sent out the Ruiz family, the Townsend family. They just started sending out different leaders of every single family out into uh, this land called Canaan. Verse 19 Verses, a few verses down it says, uh, I want you to go and check what kind of land do they live in. Come on, Moses, even Moses had the plan of God, but he didn't have the details of God. So don't, 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 don't get it twisted. God will show you a picture, but he won't give you details. He'll give you puzzle pieces. And your job is to begin to put those pieces. Why? It takes, you want to be able to say, every time that you see something that God did for you, you want to be able to say, you know what? The work of my labor is... Is, 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 has been birthed from the fruit of my faith. Amen? That means that I went to work. Man, I worked the word of God. I believed the word of God. I stood on the word of God. I spit the word of God. Amen? Come on, you always spoke, you declared the word, and then it happened. And so he says, hey, go look and see if, if, if that's, if, if, what kind of land that is to live in. Is it good or bad? Come on, man, go in there and tell me, is it any good or is it bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or are they fortified? How's the soil? Check the soil, okay? Is it fertile or is it poor? Are there trees in it or not? Come on, do, you, do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was the season for the first ripe of? What season was it? Listen, I love summer because it's, it's the season of grapes. And we tear up grapes all summer long. And, and, and listen, and, and God's saying, I, I, I have some grapes for you. Ready? Ooh, oh, you missed it, girl. Sorry, missed the grape. Just start catching people. There you go. It's, it's, it's the season of grapes. Season of grapes. Come on, catch it. If you don't catch it, may the Lord forgive you. Way back there. There you go. There you go. How about her? Boom, there you go, come on, ooh, oh, oh, and he ate it, and he ate it. How about way back there? <laughs> Booyah, oh, did he catch it? Did he miss it? Come on, how about that, there you go, grapes. So it was a season of grapes, so, so they, they, they went in the perfect season. Aren't you glad that when God says do something, it's, it's the season? So don't miss the season, because when God says something, it's the season, and so it was the season of grapes, verse 30. So they go out and they see the grapes. As a matter of fact, when they come back with the grapes, let me show you a picture of what it looked like because the Bible describes them as this huge, ginormous cluster. And this is what it looks like. It says it took two men to carry the grapes because the grapes were so fruitful. Listen, God was showing them what I'm giving you is not what, you're, what you can obtain with your own wisdom, your own strength. What I'm giving you is supernatural. I mean, the grapes, can you imagine grapes that big? I mean, look, look at these sad grapes. I mean, the, <laughs> uh, like, uh, I give you, I don't eat, I will not eat this at home. There's no way. I, I go for the big dogs. I mean, God, God goes bigger. God, God, God has some grapes for some people here. Come on, you got, some, you got some grapes with your name on it. And, and some of us, man, we're just, we're just not, we're not willing to wait for the big supernatural grapes. We'd rather just settle for the little itty bitty grapes that we can obtain with our own strength, with our own intelligence, our own smartness. And God's saying, man, you're just, you're just dreaming too low, man. Grapes, big grapes, large grapes. And so they're carrying them, they're like, Dang, Mosey, you, do you, you won't get it. Now, mind you, they were in there in this land for 40 days. I mean, God, listen, God just told Moses, tell him to go look at it. These dudes, they went on vacation for 40 days. They were enjoying it. 
They're, they were like, forget those people. We'll just hang in here for a little bit. They come back and they're like, look, now look, verse, verse 30 of the same chapter 13. They came back and, and they were like, oh, we can't do this. We, we, there's just no way. Uh, they, they started telling Moses, uh, we got good news and bad news, Moses. And Moses was like, good news? How can there, dude, you just brought like huge, ginormous grapes we've never seen before. How could it be bad? And he says, no, we got, which one do you want to hear? He's like, all right, start the good news. He's like, well, the good news is, man, you were right. <laughs> dude, what God said was like on point. Everything, the land was made up of milk and honey. Man, the land, it, it has potential to produce anything and everything that we even think about sowing. Oh, man, the walls are fortified. So if we come in here, man, we're protected from any enemies in the future, baby. Come on. The potential is amazing. It's huge, right? huge it's huge that was that was the good news and they say okay so what's the bad news oh well the bad news is that you know there's some big people in there man there's some giants in the land and 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 so here's the problem let me tell you something whenever you possess your future whatever that land is going to look like it will always have giants see many of you you get to enjoy this part of our ministry right now but when we arrive to new hall California, when we arrived here on Main and 8, we had to slay some giants before you ever got here. So you're reaping the grapes of what others have labored for you. Isn't that awesome? And you are going to slay some giants in this season of our ministry for the next 5, 10 years when those people will be here and be like, man, y'all, y'all, we did all this. You guys are just enjoying the blessed assurance now, but then those people will also have to slay some giants. So any single land that you take for God, any single promise of God that God shows you as a preferred future, there will be giants in that land. It is not an option. It comes with the land. It's gonna be big price tags. Huh? Nobody likes big price tags, right? Yeah, it comes with big challenges. It comes with big disappointments. It comes with big, like huge. I'm doing a trumpet impression right now. Huge. <laughs> huge difficulties. But the rewards are great. The blessings are supernatural. Come on, the victories are glorious. It's worth the fight. It's worth, Caleb said, y'all need to shut up because this is worth my future. It's worth my future. And so many people today in the body of Christ, you know what? They honestly don't value the preferred future God has given them because they rather settle for the preferred future they've created for themselves because it's comfortable. Nobody's rocking the boat. You know what? I already got my little home. I already got my little car. I got my job. I got my 401K. And God's like, I didn't create you to maintain. I created you to create some awesome things with me. Amen. Amen? And so the Caleb, then Caleb, verse 30, then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, man, we should go up right now and take possession of this land. For we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. What's wrong with you, Caleb? Man, are you kidding me? We can't go against these people. These people, they're big, man. Huge. And, and he says, we can't attack them. They're, they're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. Isn't it funny how people just, they'll just, they'll just create huge assumptions, right? Like, like they're going, they're like, man, we can't afford it. Man, we can't take, we can't. You're already making the decision. For some of you, let me tell you something. This isn't to uh, condemn you or put you down. Some of you, you've settled for the job you have. You've settled for it. Because you've already made the assumption that you're not good enough for what you really want. And so you start viewing yourself. You see, every single time you enter the land that God is promising you, there will be giants. And those giants will expose how you view yourself. They will expose you. And so they're saying they're too big, they're too strong. And look what he says. And, and they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours the living in it. Man, they just tear everything up. Then they were enjoying 40 days of vacation. What do you mean? See, when you're a man or woman of excuses, you're always going to make an excuse of why not. Always. 
And it says, <laughs> and the land we explore devours it, and all the people we saw there are great size. But how many know that what God was trying to show them was even greater than the size they were looking at? And we saw uh, the, the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak came from Nephilim, and we seemed like, and we seemed like what? Grasshoppers in what? Our own eyes, and we looked the same to and isn't that just so sad and so shocking how people will not only view themselves. Come on, the only perception you have is the one that you've believed, the one you created about yourself. And then you take it the next step up, you take it to the next level and you say, and they see us the same way. Who made that up? Who came up with that lie? I'll tell you who did. You, me. We came up with that. God said, I'm giving you the land. Why are you making excuses of how big these giants are? And, 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 and this relates to every single one of us. They returned back with bad news and good news, but they understood that the potential was great, and yet it wasn't worth the fight. You have to learn how to fight the battle for your future. You must. You have to. You have to believe, you gotta have a Caleb spirit inside of you and say, let's go take this right now. Let's go possess this land. Let's, let's go get what God has given us. Man, this is mine. And you know what? That is gonna have to be a personal revelation that you have to have from God. God, now how am I gonna do that? And God, God will begin to give you step by step, but there is a, a, a big, huge scrape with your name on it just waiting for you. And so how did God get the people uh, from out, of, out of Egypt into the desert to Canaan? You know how he did that? one little step at a time. He didn't do a shortcut. He could have taken the shortcut and got them to the promised land so much sooner, but you know what God does? God just takes his time with you. You know why? Because along the way, some of you have been saying, man, it's been 14 years, Pastor, for me. I have yet to see my promise. Well, guess what? Just think this. Maybe God's been protecting you from something. Why aren't I married yet? Because you probably would have jacked it up by now. And God's like, okay, let's, let's go ahead and just work some things out, you know, because you're a little cray-cray, you know. And so God's, God, God protects you. Why, why, why isn't my business blowing up yet? Because you don't have the character to sustain what I want to give you yet. I'm trying to work some character in you. I'm trying to build some wisdom in you. You know, for example, for me as a pastor, why isn't this church blowing up more? And we listen, if you were to really do statistic, this church definitely has grown supernaturally. In it take, and I can take every single fact, but at the end of the day, you know what? Everything's in God's timing, right? I, now, I can do some things and make this thing grow, right? But I need to stay in step with God every step of the way so that we don't blow up and then we blow out. And that's the problem. We got a lot of blow-ups and blow-outs. I want to be able to sustain what God has given me, but we need to have the spiritual maturity to sustain what he wants to give you. I think sometimes people, they abort too soon <laughs> or other people abort too late. And so we have to know, okay, what is God's plan for us, for me? And then when God speaks it, when he says the season of grapes is in, you got to go get them grapes. You got to go. You cannot miss the grape season. Amen? Okay, so I get it. Stuff happens. Look at this. Philippians 3, 10 and 16. We're going to close now. Philippians 3. Then I'm going to give you three simple little points and we're out of here. You guys enjoying this so far? Yes. Okay, good. Let's end it. 11, 13. We're good. Last verse, stay in it with me. We're done. New Testament, Paul begins to see the church having some struggles. They're challenged because life is getting in the way and, and, and people are getting discouraged. And Paul says in Philippians 3.10, he says, I want to know Christ. Come on, Paul says, in the midst of all this condition, I'm not, he's saying this from a jail cell. I just want to know Christ more. I want to know Christ more. I want to know Christ deeper. And he says, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so, somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained all this. In other words, man, I haven't even got there yet. I haven't even obtained all this yet. Or have already arrived at my goal. Hopefully you have a goal in life. You know what God's goal is? Is that every man would come to the knowledge of him. 
Do you know that's God's goal? That's God's dream. At the end of all this, at the end of all this thing called earth, God wants every single person to come to the salvation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. That is God's goal. What's your goal? And is God... And is God in the middle of that goal? Is God a part of that goal of your life? And Paul's saying, I haven't seen my goal yet. But I what? I what? But I press on. I haven't seen that, that, that house yet, but I'm going to press on. I haven't seen that healing yet, but I press on. I haven't seen that restoration of my family yet, but I press on. I haven't seen that miracle yet, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, but the one thing I do is I forget what is behind and I start straining toward what is ahead. Come on, stop looking at your past and start looking at the preferred future for God. Come on, God's already been in your future. He's just waiting for you to get there, amen? He says, I, that's the only th one thing. I have to forget those stripes that I was beat with yesterday. I can't be dwelling on the hurt I experienced. I can't be thinking about those Christians that betrayed me. Those people that said that were for me were actually against me. I can't even begin to just focus on them. I have to look forward. I have to press forward. That's the one thing. If I can do anything in this season of my life, I have to stop looking back. Stop looking back. Press. Press. You know why? You know why people don't like pressing? Because it requires work. It requires dying to yourself. It requires humility. It requires you to come to the place where you say, you know what, God, if this is my season, if the thorn is in my side, then your grace is sufficient for me. Like Paul was spoken to by God to him when he was, he said, there's a thorn in my side. Take it from me. God said, no, 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 I'm not taking it from you. I'm going to leave it there. But when you're weak, you're going to feel my strength. Huh? He says, my grace, my unmerited favor my ability, God saying, my ability can conquer your disabilities. That, that is exactly what God was telling Paul. He was telling Paul, my grace, grace will cover you. And he said, I press toward what is ahead. I press toward the goal to win the prize for which God has what? He called me. I know what he called me to. And it's heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature, all of us then who are mature, hopefully you're maturing in Jesus and you're not just that hit or miss Christian. You go to church when you feel like it. No. Maturity means that you are intentional. I'm ready. God, you have shown me this picture. I'm gonna, I've been walking with God for 22 years this December. I have never, ever without my children missed church. I just don't do it. Not even on vacations. On vacations, I go to church services. Why? I will not miss church. I will not miss the house of God. And some of the churches are boring than heck, but I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not there. I just want to get up and preach, you know, like... But I'm like, no, this is the time for me to receive. God, fill me. God, speak to me. God, you know, renew me. God, refresh me. God, show me. God, correct me. God, instruct me. God, do something in me. Clean me. That's the moment. That's what you do. You don't, you don't just do what you do. Doing, doing your way is doing it how you do life now. Doing it God ways experiences press. The reason most people don't know how to press is because they've never given themselves the opportunity to press at all. Why? Because the moment it gets tough, you leave. The moment it gets difficult, you quit. The moment the press is just, you feel like, I'm going to die. You ain't going to die. You're not going to die. Stop. Who, who told you? That? See, that's that over-exaggerating Israelite spirit. No, you're not going to die. The Bible says, you shall live and not die, and you shall declare the works of the Lord. You're not going to die. You're going to live. You're going to live. You're not dying. You're living. Your children are going to live. Your family's going to live. You're going to live and not die, and you will declare from the mountaintops, man, it was all God. It was all God. Hmm. And all of us then who are mature should take such a view of things and if and if on some point look and if on some point and if on some point you think differently right now maybe you're just so disappointed you're so discouraged well guess what God says well if at any point you start thinking differently from me here's what you do that too God will make clear to you 
Maybe, maybe the promise of God has become so blurry. I can't see it, God. I just, I, you've left. No, God didn't leave you. You just got blurry. God, God didn't, God, God, God didn't, he doesn't strip away visions and dreams. God's not, he doesn't give something and take it from you away. When God gives you something, God says, I am faithful to it. It's just not clear right now. That's it. It's just not clear. So you got to go back to the God of clear and say, God, clear whatever dross or whatever things have been blinding me from the truth, God, and let me see again what you want to show me. He says that too, God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. And you know what you already have attained? Please listen to me. Everybody look at me. You know what all of you have already attained? Salvation. So live up to it. God didn't die for a cheap salvation, so stop cheapening your salvation. Let your salvation cost you something. Let it cost you something. Let it cost you sacrifice. Let it cost you commitment. Let it cost you pain. Let it cost you pressing. Let it cost you something so that at least you can stand before God and say, you know, God, I didn't see everything I wanted, but I didn't stop pressing. I didn't stop pressing. I kept pressing all the more. Why? Because you know what? The one thing I've attained is my salvation and no one will steal that from me. Man, the enemy may come and steal my dream for a month, a year, 10 years, but he won't take my salvation. I have attained my salvation and I will live up to this salvation and all is well. Amen? That's what you've already attained. You need to give God a big hand clap of thanksgiving and say, thank you for my salvation. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to heaven. Come on, you already have a heavenward dream. You're going to spend eternity in heaven when you receive Christ. I'll just end it right here. We just won't do this. Forget the points. Go to the app and there's the points. I, how, how many people here like basketball? Okay, I don't like it at all. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I don't like it. But I did see when, 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 when Kobe... That, that's one thing I did see when it was his last game. Y'all remember that? Anybody watch that? When it was like the last game? Like, points, come on, baby. Yeah, and he, he, he came out like the man. I mean, his speech was somewhat boring, but you know what? He was, he, you know, it, it started getting juicier as you heard him. And in his speech, he begins to talk about his life, right? About his career, about his wins, his losses, about his victories, about his everything, right? But he comes to a point of his, of his, of his, of his speech, his message to the world, to the world. Man, before millions and millions and millions of people worldwide watching this man who fulfilled his call, who used his platform, right? In whatever condition, doesn't matter. That's on him and God. And I know they call him the, the Black Mamba. And uh, I didn't know that. I'm like, what is that? But hey, that's okay. And, and when he was... When he was giving his message, he was like, ah, right? He's, ah. And then when he was done, he goes like this and he says, Mamba out. Boom. And he dropped the mic. I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna try that on Sunday. <laughs> I'm like, and then I'm like, and then I'm like, no, it's too expensive. No. <laughs> and then I'm like, there you go again, you little Israelite mindset. Over a mic, you won't drop it. But here's 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 the revelation I get for my personal self. See, um, look, I already forgot his name. Yeah, Kobe. Kobe, Kobe Mamba, Black Mamba. He, he, he wasn't the originator of Mamba Out. Jesus was the originator of It Is Finished. And the way you want to end your life is not you are finished. You want to end your life where out of your own lips, out of your own mouth, out of your own heart, out of your own spirit, you say, I am finished. I am finished. It is finished. Ruiz, out. But the mic falls, and then my son Isaac picks up at the ball, <laughs> and I'm the next one, right? we got to leave. <laughs> Hopefully your kids do that. Listen, you got, you got to learn how to, how to live life 
and, and live up to what you've already attained. And when you leave this life, you will see. Everybody at the country say your last name hard like man with some pride. Ready? One, two, three. Yeah. That was weird, but that was awesome, right? <laughs> Just like, I'm going to be like this. At, at, sorry, bro. I'm going to be like 100 years old when I give you the mic. So you'll probably be like 89. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I won't do that. But I will give my, the ministry to my, whoever's called, whether it's my son or not. No pressure on him ever. Uh, honestly, I, I told him, like, don't ever be in ministry because of your dad. Do it because God called you to. But there will come a time where I will say, Ruiz, out. And I will walk home to the courtyards of my God. And I want to hear, well done, Mauricio. Good and faithful servant. Now enter your rest. Don't you dare cheapen your salvation. Finish it. Don't you stop treating your salvation like whatever. I serve God when, when, it, when I feel like it, when I don't feel like it. Oh, I'm done. Finish. Finish. Stand to your feet. Finish. Let's go home. Stand to your feet. Lift your hands to heaven. High in the air. And just, just begin to just whisper to God, God, I love you. Come on, just come, Jesus. I, I, I will live up to what I have already attained. Say to him, I will live up for what I already attained. Say to him, say to him, I will live up to it, Father. Convict my heart, Tom. Convict me, God. Lord, convict me, correct me, instruct me, clean me. Come on, tell God, clean my heart, God. Clean my life, clean my mouth, clean my thoughts. Clean me, Father, for I'm your vessel of honor. God, I want to end this life and end it well so that I can hear your faithful words. Well done, good and faithful servant. In the name of Jesus. Father, I ask you for a divine reversal for every single person. Maybe there are people here who have walked away, who have stopped pressing. A divine reversal in the name of Jesus over your life. And Lord, I thank you that this is the season where people will begin to lean into God. This is the season where people will begin to believe you, God, for the graves that you have already given us, for the preferred future that you have already spoken to us. Father, we will not quit, we will not stop, and we will not allow the enemy to steal kill or destroy father and lord today we understand that when we walk into the land of promise the giants will always be there but we shall slay those giants and take possession of the land in the mighty name of jesus we pray give the lord a big hand clap amen amen If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.